So, well, welcome everybody to this uh, first CLAX event of 2021. It's a great pleasure for us to have uh, Nicole Bonino, um, who is um, currently um, um, visiting research fellow at the University of Manchester, as well as assistant professor of Spanish at the University of Virginia. Nicole's uh, research focuses on the interconnections between migration and urban environment in the global south, with specific attention conveying to the analysis of Latin American metropolises, metropolises, it's a difficult word, and the depiction of urban social cultural dynamics in literature and visual art. Um, I forgot to mention that Nicole has a PhD from the University of Virginia and a BA and MA from the University of Turin. And without further ado, I will uh, let Nicole, yeah, I will give the floor, the virtual floor to Nicole. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ignacio, for the presentation. And thank you, Peter and Ignacio for inviting me. And thanks everyone for being here today. I'm gonna share a PowerPoint, so hopefully I'm gonna make it less, less boring since it's very difficult to pay attention for a long time in Zoom. Can you guys see the PowerPoint fine? I assume so. Okay, excellent. So the, um, today I would like to explore with you some of the implications of the concept of eco hybridity in the southern cone and its metropolises through the description of theoretical concepts and via the support of examples drawn from art and literature. Even though this talk is geographically and socially confined to under-regulated residential areas and other urban spaces, the theoretical ideas that I will introduce today can be considered within a larger rather, including several other contemporary reality on a global scale. Okay, so I would like to start by introducing you to some astonishing numbers that will show you how intense metropolitan life is in the Southern Cone. According to the Department of Economic and Social Affairs of the United Nations, 68% of the world population is projected to live in urban areas by 2015. Latin American metropolises such as Sao Paulo, Buenos Aires, Lima, and Rio de Janeiro are home for more than 10 million people. According to the data collected by the World Bank, you have here a graphic that I made to make it visually easier to focus. 62% of Paraguayan, 87% of Brazilian, 88% of Chilean, 92% of Argentinian, and 95% of Uruguayan live in urban centers. A great amount of the urban population is represented by immigrants, forced to face cultural and geographical challenges, as well as the lack of resources such as food, potable water, and electricity. Often these individuals work informally as bricklayers, cleaners, and street vendors, and are paid under the table. This means that they do not receive official forms of support from governmental and local institutions, and they don't have healthcare or pension funds. The concept of eco that I'm introducing today is strictly connected to diasporic movements. As a part of the natural realm, humans are subjected to the modification of the surrounding environment with which they interact and coexist. In the Southern Cone, migration is not only exogenous, which means that it's proceeding from outside of the national territory, but also endogenous as several slum dwellers are actually local citizens who are migrating from the countryside towards the city or from a region to another because of climatic, economic, or political reasons. For the majority of these people, the city is regarded as an opportunity to start over. Every time we move, we leave something behind. But fortunately, this process is not irreversible. As a matter of fact, by living a social reality and embracing a new one, we pave the way for a new construction of the self, composed by enforced or spontaneous processes 
of cultural, social, and artistic assemblage. In this sense, urban migration is a perfect example of this process of reconstruction. In fact, once a traveler settles down in a new city and gets in contact with new traditions and social factors, a bilateral transformation begins. And the phenomenon consisting in the creation of mixed culture entities is known as cultural hybridization. Theorist Nestor Garcia Canclini and Homi Baba investigate the phenomenon of cultural hybridization, describing it as the emergence of a new multiculturalism in which different cultural forms coexist. According to Argentinian Canclini, the term cultural hybridity can explain the social state of Latin American countries caught between traditions that have not yet gone and a modernity that has not yet arrived. On the other hand, Indian English Homi Baba employs the term hybridity in a post-colonial sense to talk about cultural identity emerged after colonialism. Well, according to me, the idea of hybridization is actually useful to explain the ecological and cultural production provoked by the encounter between immigrant communities and urban landscapes. Examples of culture hybrids can be found in linguistic phenomena, for example, Lunfardo, but also Cocoliche, Spanglish, can be found in gastronomic products, for example, Tex-Mex cuisine, or Milanesa Napolitana. Uh, here you have a picture of Milanesa Napolitana, which is a, a typical Argentinian dish, which is created by fusing together two different traditions from Italy, a culinary tradition from Milan, Milanesa, which is a fried steak basically, and then a sauce from Naples. So what we have with the Milanesa Napolitana, which is something that does not exist in Italy, is a new product, which is not just a copy or a wrong interpretation, like some people say, but is a new cultural artifact produced by the encounter of two different traditions. Other examples are music genres, such as tango and cumbia vichera, or architectural outcomes, such as the Argentinian conventillos or the uh, Brazilian favelas. Metropolises are powerful hybrid constructions since they are the result of the social cultural sedimentation and intersection of different fragments. So how is the cultural heritage of immigrant communities intertwined with the urban dynamics of the Southern Cone? And what are the consequences of the assemblage of the fragments composes this hybrid mosaic? Well, in order to answer these questions, I'm currently working on a multidisciplinary study at the intersection of urbanism and the humanities, focused on examining the social, cultural, ecological, and architectural implications involved in the adaptation of diasporic groups in the city and its periphery. In the Southern Cone, these dynamics determine the creation of hybrid constructions in terms of music, visual art, for example, street art and works made with trash and recycled materials and literature. In this slide, you have an example of one of the first museums that is born to uh, host and archive Cultura Vichera, which is the, the culture born in the streets and in the favelas, in the slums, in the vichas. And this museum in particular is in Argentina, but there are a lot of street museums and um, museos vicheros all over the world, and especially in Latin America. And then to the left, you have two examples of what I call uh, literatura vichera. Uh, and the author in this case is Juan Diego Encardona, but there are several examples of literature focus on, on what I'm talking about today. This massive cultural creation is sometimes concealed by a veiled xenophobia 
rejection of minorities and anguish towards poverty. Consequently, its powerful message aimed at celebrating the dynamism and diversity of the city fails to emerge. To uncover this overlooked world, I approach the city from multiple perspectives, spatially, socioculturally, artistically, and eco-critically. And here you have some examples of, of my approach to the city and what my research does. For example, spatially, it's by focusing on the rural dimensions, the peripheral areas, and other uh, central areas of the city, socioculturally by investigating the consequences of internal racism or social paranoia, artistically by giving voice to uh, musical expression and under, underground arts, and then ecocritically by studying the modifications caused by massive diasporic movements in terms of ecology and the environment and the architecture. I entitled this talk cities on the edge because for the metropolises that I investigate, this edge has different meanings. It is intended as a physical borders when we talk about walls, highways, railways. It's also a metaphorical construction. So the idea of the hidden cities, the visible cities, the imaging communities, and has also social connotation. If we think about economic disparity, social paranoia, xenophobia. Understanding the deepest meanings of this idea becomes fundamental in a contemporary reality characterized by global movements and extremely fast processes of urbanization. In this slide, you have two different images from two different cities in Brazil. Uh, we have Rio de Janeiro in the first picture where you can see the wall that divides the official city from the under, reg under uh, regulated residential areas. And then the second picture is a picture that became very viral, was published on The Guardian. The photographer is Luca Vieira. And this picture shows one of the, of the richest neighborhoods in Sao Paulo. And then the difference between this area and in this case, a favela named uh, Paraisopolis. So you can actually see uh, visually the, the impact of these borders, of these edges. To better understand the ecological and social cultural dynamics of urban formal sectors, which is a city, subcenters, and neighborhoods, and informal sectors, slums, and peripheries, I decided to look at the fields of ecology. So ecology, as you know, is a branch of biology whose name derives from the Greek oikos, which means house, and logia, study. The definition of ecology given by Samuel Shainer and Michael Willig in their book, The Theory of Ecology, 2011, is that ecology concerns the spatial and temporal patterns of the distribution and abundance of organisms, including the causes and consequences. For the elaboration of the critical concept of eco-hybridity, I was inspired by the idea that ecology in the literal sense of studying homes can be extended to the investigation of the physical space and the biological elements that constitute this space. In this case, the urban space of the Southern Kong, for example. The theoretical, the theoretical idea that I propose refers to the study of local and immigrant urban dwellers as organisms, analyzing their distribution and development and the causes and consequences of their settlements. Biology investigates organisms as well as the cooperation and competition between and within species. Well, my research focuses on study and cooperation and competition between humans whose race, social and political background differs, creating phenomena of rejection or acceptance. 
In my model of analysis, the biotics, which are those organisms that affect other organisms within a certain system, so these biotics are represented by the people, and the ecosystem is the city. Using science as a starting point to analyze human structures, as you know, is not something new as human ecology and urban ecology exist since the 70s. And in Argentina, for example, there is a notorious history of adapting evolutionary concepts related to natural selection and xenophobic ecological theories. And I'm thinking about eugenics and social Darwinism, but we can discuss that uh, later at the end of the talk because there is a lot to talk about this. Well, my contribution to this discourse is to investigate the role of art and literature as tools which are able to interpret a changing world affected by globalization and social diasporas. By bridging cultural hybridity, which is what I was explaining at the beginning of the talk, and urban ecology. Latin American cities are a nerve center of what I call eco-hybridity which can be summarized as a critical concept that defines the products created by the modifications of geographical and social cultural environment in response to the encounter between immigrants and urban settings. Examples of eco-hybridity are the ecological consequences provoked by massive migrations, such as the creation of camps in area non suitable for constructions, provoking, for example, deforestation, massive floods, electrical deviations, trash accumulation, health issues, and spreading of fires, or the creation of artistic outcomes that modify the ways in which the city is seen and perceived. And I'm thinking about graffiti and the popularization of the literary genre known as eco-fiction. Due to eco-hybridity, the city acquires a new mutable and malleable identity that evolves according to the processes of adaptation of urban communities and the environment where they settle down and with which they coexist. In their article entitled Putting People in a Map, Anthropogenic Biomes of the World, an article published in 2008, Alice Earle and Ramon Kuti Navin present a new term, anthropo anthropogenic biome, to describe the terrestrial biosphere altered by human interaction with ecosystems. In this slide, you have a picture that uh, helps you to visualize the idea of Navin and Early and this anthropogenic biome. The urban environment has been classified as an anthropogenic biome because it is characterized by the predominance of certain species and climate trends, such as urban heat islands perceivable across many urban areas and strictly related to the presence of humans. I'm giving you an example from the US, the city of Atlanta developed in the years because of its very densely populated, it developed a micro system uh, a microclimate that causes storms that happens only over Atlanta. So for example, during the summer, it could be sunny around Atlanta, but then on top of the city, you might see storms. And that's because of, um, in this case, urban heat. Obviously, humans are the driving force behind urban ecology and influence the environment in a variety of ways such as modifying land surfaces and waterways, introducing foreign species and altering biogemical cycles. Some of the effects of these global footprints are more apparent and we can all think about the Amazon forest, while others are more gradual. For instance, the change in global climate due to urbanization, along with the manipulation of land to suit human needs. And I'm sure that you're all familiar with the idea of the Anthropocene, which is the era where we uh, are living right now. Every geological era has fossils to help classify the period. And here I'm showing you a picture of which kind of fossils we have in the Anthropocene. 
and this is a techno fossil. So we can see the fossil of a black bear in this case, I suppose. And this is to show you how intense is um, the, the human impact on the environment of the cities. I'm now giving you an urban example of eco hybridity represented by the unregulated residential areas known, for example, as favelas in Brazil or uh, vicious miserias in Argentina. eco hybridity processes lead to the creation of new spaces within the city. In the southern cone, because of urbanization, structural adjustment policies and massive migration, urban areas are now densely populated, like we saw at the beginning of the talk. Not able to afford the costs of the city, immigrants and locals settle down in improvised residential solutions built with discarding material and often not suitable for a salubrious lifestyle. Despite the presence of a labor market and the consumption of urban goods and services, most Latin American and regulated residential areas do not constitute a well-defined urban social space within the boundaries of the city. Not only society, but also urban configuration contributes to their marginalization in physical and metaphorical ways. So usually these residential areas are geographically separated by the rest of the city by natural or artificial barriers. Here you have a picture of Villa 31, which is uh, an unregulated residential area in Buenos Aires, one of the biggest. And you can see how it is physically, geographically and visually separated from, from the city, in particular by a highway and a railway. And the city that you see on the other side of the uh, railway is actually Retiro and Recoleta. You can see on Google Maps on the right. There is a Four Seasons Hotel right in front of this fisha, and that's because those are among the richest neighborhood of the city. Some other times, and an example can be done in the city of Buenos Aires again, these re unregulated residential areas develop right in the center of the city. So for example, in Buenos Aires, we have uh, unregulated residential areas right close to La Casa Rosada, which is the Argentinian White House. Literature and art are shifting the focus of attention towards urban realities. To denounce the miserable situation characterizing the lives of these vulnerable communities, in 1957, Argentinian author Bernardo Verbinski published Vicia Miseria Tambien es America, re-edited in 2003. Vicia Miseria is also America, would be a translation in English. Influenced by the aesthetic sensibility of social realism, Verbinski represents the universe of the slum through documentary-like lens, creating a hybrid novel at the crossroads between journalism and literature. Throughout his novel, Verbinski offers accurate descriptions aimed at representing the misery of Argentinian slums, the humanity of its inhabitants and their resilience and solidarity by denouncing the lack of social and governmental protection. In this work, the city becomes a map of the human psyche, leading to the exploration and representation of the challenges faced by the individual. What makes Visha Miseria a detailed documentary of eco hybridity dynamics is the representation of the different sorts of calamities that affect unregulated residential areas on a daily basis. As a matter of fact, the architectural structure and the geographical location of these areas increase their fragility and expose them to unexpected environmental phenomena. Here we have two examples, two pictures that are going to support what I'm saying right now. In April 2013, the northeastern section of the province of Buenos Aires experienced several flash floods. Transportation routes were submerged, and the majority of the population experienced power short, shortages. The situation in the Vichy, as you can imagine, was miserable. In fact, vast portions of the local uh, slums situated in the north side of the metropolitan area of Buenos Aires were underwater. Floods 
are a common threat in these areas, and Verbinski, as a careful reporter, does not omit it. In fact, in his novel, the words lluvia, rain, and agua, water, are used precisely a hundred times throughout his novel. Water is at the same time a resource of life and death. On the one hand, it periodically destroys the handmade houses of the community through massive floods, as the slum protagonist of the novel arises in a geographical area not suitable for construction. But on the other hand, water allows people to drink, cook, and maintain their families. The dramatic conditions of the inhabitants of Argentinian slums are depicted by Verbinski and are, are far from being a matter confined to the 1950s and 60s, which is the time where the novel was published and disseminated. Another problem affected the ecology of the southern cone is trash. The word that summarizes the creational process from which many urban spaces derives, according to me, is recycling. A great example of eco hybridity. Contemporary slums are built with discarded material proceeding from the city, which sometimes uses these areas as landfills or they can be found in the proximity of harbors or highways or railways. Trash acquires for these communities a different meaning. It is a danger because it leads to health problems, a way to gather the members of the community, which is a practice that is described in several novels or interviews, or a way to survive, burning trash for heat, collecting trash for money, or using trash as construction material. Connected to trash and recycling, the last practical example of equability which, with which I'm concluding my talk is Juanito va la ciudad. Uh, Juanito goes to the city. This is a monumental collage documenting the life of Juanito Laguna, an archetype poor boy from a Latin American slum. The series highlights the contrast between the life of these children living in these slums and modernization. As you can see from this slide to the left, Juanito initially appeared in Bernie's paintings as an oil painted image. One day, however, as the artist walked through Juanito's neighborhood, a radical change in the conception of the character took place. Bernie realized that if he really wanted to convey the misery that surrounded Juanito's life, he had to do it not with paint, but with the discarded materials that made up Juanito's universe. From then on, Bernie bought fewer cans of paint and began to accumulate a veritable reservoir of non-traditional materials. Between 1960 and 1964, Bernie created approximately 15 monumental assemblages and a series of very large woodcut prints based on the story of Juanito. In these works, the encounter between the artist and rejected materials convey a new hybrid and non-traditional artistic product in which trash itself is fraught with social, culture and ecological meanings. And the picture to the right is an example of what I've just explained made with recycled materials. So in summary, where can we study the elements that constitute the idea of eco hybridity? In interviews, in oral history, documentaries, movies, special studies in the fields of sociology, social justice, but also in literature and visual arts, which register and preserve human dynamics. Nowadays, contemporary novelas vicheras, slam novel, and arte vichero, slam art, such as cumbia, murals, photography, encapsulate the critical idea of eco hybridity. The contact between local communities and immigrants determines a process of unstoppable creation that affects the ecological world in its integrity, from humans to the natural and urban environment. Examples of eco hybridity are visible everywhere, but the city represents the stage where these phenomena are the most relevant. Recently, since 2007, critics such as Dr. Carlos Bosch 
started analyzing artistic echo and cultural hybrid manifestation, such as Cine Vichero, the cinema created in Latin American slums, as a process of cultural inclusion. And exhibition and culture gatherings, such as the Argentinian Export de Vichero or the Brazilian Favela Arte Festival, cast light on the architectural, artistic, and literary manifestations of Southern Cone communities. Investigating eco hybridity processes and their culture, ecological, metaphorical, and social characteristics is therefore fundamental in order to better understand urban dynamics while making the cities of the Southern Cone a geographical and metaphorical space available for us to analyze and comprehend. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm very interested in hearing any comments or ideas. Thank you, Nicole, uh, for, for this very interesting presentation. Um, so people can just, I, I cannot see everybody. So perhaps if you use uh, your um, virtual hand for questions, uh, I can organize the, the Q&A, the, the discussion. Okay, I can kick, kick off with a, with a question. And Nicole, mm -hmm. I saw that you, you your examples were um, Berbisky's novel and uh, Juanito Laguna, right? This is yeah. from the 50s, and this is the moment under the, the impact of modernization theory, suddenly the slums emerge as a, as a big problem that needs to be tackled, right? Mm -hmm. And the approach from the state is, um, the, the ideology is we need to eradicate them. No? As eradication is the main course of action of this, this of, of, of the government of the Revolución Libertadora and the governments that follow. Uh, but obviously now um, some people still talk about slums as something that needs to be eradicated, but they are consolidated. You show the photograph of, of the slums next to the most one of the most expensive areas of, of Argentina. Uh, and you mentioned at the end, uh, Novelas Villeras, you, you, there's a photo of uh, Cesar Gonzalez. So like, it's interesting because this is not, this, the, the, the inhabitants of that particular uh, ecological space are the ones who are now structuring a discourse, a cultural um, discourse that uh, is obviously not the same that, than, I don't know, Berbisky or, or um, um, or I forgot the creator of Juanito Laguna. In any case, this is the middle class talking about, yeah, exactly. This is the middle class talking about the slum dwellers. And now the slum dwellers are creating culture that has a, an impact beyond the, the confines of the slum. How, how is this new, more recent perspective different from, from that perspective that you were mentioning from the 50s? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you gave a very precise summary of what happened in the past 70 years in Argentina. Uh, sometimes I like to use very old examples to, to catch the attention of the fact that nothing really changed or if something changed, how, how is the reaction of people towards these changes? And in this case, we can see that the, the feelings that people are experiencing the social paranoia, the xenophobia is still there. And the examples from the 50s are contemporary examples compared to what I do. Uh, for example, what I did in my PhD dissertation, which was analyzing the 19th century situation uh, in Argentina and the anguish towards minorities and towards uh, immigrants coming from Italy. And had, like years and years has passed, but the, the attitude of the people is still the same. And it's actually very uh, shocking to analyze some of the comments that you can find on YouTube, for example, or on Instagram and social media, which are a more contemporary form of communication than uh, the, the novel that we saw, the realistic novel of 300 pages from the 50s. And so you can still see that all of this discourse is absolutely still contemporary and uh, it's dividing the, the opinion of not only the people living there, but sometimes even within the same community, there are this sort of discussion. And this is what is called as internal racism. So uh, within the same communities, there are problems like that. 
And I think that what you were mentioning about art is that sometimes it's very useful to look at art in terms of literature, visual art, and uh, exhibitions to understand what is going on on a social level and to interpret the feelings that um, that are characterizing people in this sense. And I think sometimes art is a is an easy mean to communicate. For example, if you think about uh, the way kids express their emotions, they usually tend to do that through drawings. I think it's a, it's an immediate form of communication that they can also help um, get into those areas where it's difficult sometimes to to express their their voice. And Luis, you, you have a question, right? Yes, thank you. Uh, I was building on what you just you just have said. I was I wanted to ask you if you could expand a little bit on uh, the role of literature and art, because I'm thinking that um, literature. We always say that literature is not has not only the power to register a social reality, but also to intervene in that social reality. And I was wondering if your work. Uh, um, goes into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I agree with that statement, absolutely. It's not just the passive registration of what's going on, but sometimes it can definitely intervene in the, in the discourse. And it's important when we talk about literature in terms of novels, for example, of material that, that is published, who can access that? So not all the time people who can access them are people from, from the real, the realities that we are analyzing. Uh, for example, it's, it's sometimes hard for people living in unregulated residential areas to have the, the ability of expressing their voices and publish their thoughts. And so um, in, this, in this sense, there are other forms of, of art, not necessarily the novel, but they can be graphic novels, graphic poems, uh, murals and other sorts of visual art they can they can help uh, uh, portray their their perspective and in this sense I think that the literature and art in all their forms can be very democratic in a way so allowing everyone to to express their their point of view which is something that I think connecting to the the question that Ignacio had something that is different compared to the past, because in the past, obviously, if we're thinking about the 19th century, you only have one perspective, and that perspective is from the, the elite, uh, the, the higher social class, the political parties, and the intellectuals, and you lose absolutely uh, a great amount of, of discourse, which is sometimes the discourse that you're talking about. So you're talking about people without knowing anything about what their life is and without giving them the opportunity to intervene in this discourse. Okay, so Pete and then Tanya. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. That was, um, that was interesting and interesting to see some of those images as well. Um, very sort of engaging. Um, I was just wondering, I, I wasn't quite sure that I understood what was being added by the whole um, framing of, of your uh, project in terms of ecology, mm -hmm. you know, because um, a lot of what you were saying about low income settlements in Latin America, about these urban settlements, et cetera, was, was very familiar and has been, you know, dealt with uh, in the past a lot without using that kind of framing of, of ecology. So I was just wondering, what exactly is being added but to by what you're adding by using that framing and then um a second thing is kind of picking up a bit on what ignacio was saying and what um uh luis i think it was just saying just now which is um you know the the, uh, the concept of hybridity <coughs> as used by Canclia, garcia canclini and um homie baba <coughs> you know they they uh, use that concept as a kind of inherently, they see hybridity as an inherently subversive uh, or has inherently subversive potential to it um, because it's mixing things that are not usually mixed or creating products that are unexpected and so on. So there's something 
you know, they presented as inherently subversive and they've been criticized, you know, or a lot of people who use the concept of hybridity have been criticized for assuming that that, that it's inherently or subversive, subversive or has inherently subversive potential to it. Mm -hmm. um, because in some circumstances, hybridity can simply kind of reproduce um, some of the hierarchies and differences that are part of the status quo. Um, so I just wondered, and to some extent also, then hybrid products can become consumer items which people buy and purchase and thereby somehow, somehow reinforce the kind of the basics of capitalism and so on that and the, some of the aesthetic hierarchies of capitalism that um, are part of the status quo, etc. So I wasn't quite clear in what way some of the product, products that you're talking about are subversive. I mean, you answered that a little bit just now in, term, in your answer to Luis, um, but you know, I'd like to, to, you to say a little bit more about that. I mean, that, those images, for example, of um, you know, recycling tips, et cetera, which use recycled items to portray the tip. You know, what is subversive about how is that a subversive thing in your view? What are the politics of that act? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I would say that there are two questions. So I'll answer probably the first part and then the second part to make it clear. So the, per the first part was the relationship between eco hybridity and how does it add to the discourse of ecology and why do we need to use ecology to explain this kind of system? So <clears throat> I think that my, my answer would be that I was, I was looking at the um, environmental humanities. I'm collaborating with different centers in that field. And uh, I, really, I really like the way they connect and they bridge sciences and, and the humanities. And I think that some of the scientific terminology can really help to, to understand phenomena that we can see every day and that, are, that have been studied quite a lot. And so my, my idea was to, uh, to basically bridge the idea of eco hybridity in terms of, of the, the culture hybridity, the culture aspect of these studies, and also the, the environment and the representation of the, and the environment and how the, um, the urban environment is affected by the cultural products brought by diasporic movements and how those phenomena are represented within literature. And so I see, the, I see ecology as a setting of homes, especially for the, in terms of the representation of the conflicts, the interactions between these organisms of mechanism of cooperation and uh, of disruption mechanisms. And so that's, that's why I was inspired by ecology in this sense of, of studying also not only the, the physical aspect and the artistic aspect, but also the relationship between uh, of cooperation and, uh, and rejection and this in terms of, um, of racism, of xenophobia. And so basically studying <clears throat> these organisms as, as living organisms and, and not just like from, from, a, from a human perspective, but uh, the, an approach that is similar also to the, the novel by Desmond Morris, The Naked Ape, which analyzes humans as, like, as animals, as, as they are, sometimes shifting the attention from an anthropocentric point of view can, can help to, um, to see uh, different kinds of, of realities from different perspectives. And the, the second question was to the subversive nature of, of um, hybridity. Uh, yes, they are both, both the critics are talking about hybridity in terms of a subversive, with a subversive nature. Mm, the, I, don't, I don't see a hybridity in the sense of with this, this um, subversive nature itself. But I, I think that the, sub, the subversive nature could be in the aspect of have being able to give voice to underrepresented communities in this sense of changing, uh, changing the discourse from uh, an elit elitistic point of view to a more democratic aspect. 
And so it's not necessarily connected to, to the idea of sub, um, subversive, but more to the idea of the creation of new products based on the encounter of different products. And the idea of a product that is not just a copy of another reality or a wrong uh, imitation, but a new, uh, a new production, which is something that didn't exist before. Uh, so Tanya and Jane. Hi, th thanks for that. Um, so I, I lost my second question. I was trying, I, I got caught up with what you were saying. So um, I still have two questions though. I mean, the, the first one is about when you say about giving voice, is it, is it, is it you giving voice to somebody else it, or, or are the people themselves already kind of claiming that, that voice uh, through, through the art and the literature that they are, they're producing? So I think when we talk about giving voice, it's got kind of a patronizing connotation. It's as if we, we as, as researchers, as academics, have that power to give voice to other people, which I, I hope mm -hmm. often it's not really the case. I mean, sometimes we say that we do, but are we actually able to do that? Yeah. So a, a bit of, um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit on that. And um, the question that I had about, so about migration. So you were talking about, um, migration you used the word diaspora and I felt what was missing from um, from your account was was the fact that so a distinction between internal migration and international migration although you, you do speak about both but in terms of in terms of the timeline the earlier period and and in in the novel Berblitsky's uh, novel so that he mainly speaks about internal migration Mm -hmm. um, and while the, the recent um, increase in, in the migration question within the informal settlements, particularly in Argentina, is related to international migration. Mm -hmm. And so there are threats that, that link both of those. The racism that internal migrants experience is very similar to the racism that international migrants from neighboring countries have, have been experiencing over the last 30 years or so. But what distinguishes those two groups is the, the question of citizenship. So internal migrants have access to Argentinian citizenship. International migrants are, have a very different relationship with the state and with the rights that they, they, might, they might have. Um, and now I found the other question I had, which was about international migrants in, in the arts and the literature, the, the more contemporary ones. So what I find in, in a lot of the social science literature on informal settlements, international migrants are not really talked about unless the person who's doing the research is somebody who talks about migration and then they only talk about migrants. Mm -hmm. So there is a real disconnection in uh, studies of informality, not acknowledging that some of the population is of migrant origins, international migrants not have sit who don't have citizenship. And those who study migration who are only see migrants who might be living in informal settlements. So I was just wondering whether in some of the art that you were, um, that you talked about whether this, this aspect is, so whether, whether there is some, some of the art that talks to the international migration population in informal settlements currently living particularly in Argentina. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, the giving voice, I totally agree with you, is not from the scholar. It's more uh, art and literature themselves, like the, the creation of this of this product is able to to lend voice or to help like communicating um, to helping these these communities to communicate. So that happens through art and literature. I think the scholar yeah, can just like take notes and, and help understand and make people understand. But I agree with you that uh, the scholar does not give a voice because that would be like, um, like a position of, of supremacy in that sense. And then, uh, yeah, the discourse of internal migration or external migration, it's especially I'm thinking about Argentina right now 
it's it varies according to to the the chronological period where we're talking about because uh, in the 19th century we were talking about um, international migration coming from Spain, coming from Italy and other countries in Europe and also in Asia. Uh, then Verbinski, like you mentioned, it's talking about internal migration, internal considering the southern cons. So we have people from Paraguay, people from Bolivia, Uruguay. And, uh, and now you were mentioning the relationship between uh, Argentinian citizens and then inter international migration. And <clears throat> I think that the discourse now is yes, towards international migration. So outside of Argentina and Latin America, but I think it's still uh, also towards internal migration considering like the Southern cone. So let's say that it's, it's also towards um, Bolivian and and Uruguayan and other people. I was, yeah. Well, what what were you mentioning? No, sorry. When I'm in internal migration, yeah, it's migration yeah. within Argentina. So it's yeah, people within. moving from rural areas to urban areas. Mm -hmm. And international is I'm I'm counting Bolivians and Paraguayans as being international yeah. migrants because they're coming from another country. Yeah. Yeah. And so what was, the, what was your, your question about it? So, no, it, it, was, it was just a comment that, that yeah. doesn't really feature in, um, in, in your chronology. And mm -hmm. it, I think it does matter in terms of how, um, how these different populations are positioned in terms of the state. Mm -hmm. So if you're talking about internal migrants coming from rural to urban areas or whether it's international migrants coming from another country. Um, but the specific question is whether these, the international migrants are featuring in the arts that you've talked about. Ah, okay, yeah. That's produced. Mm -hmm. more recently. Yes. So let's say that uh, as far as my researcher now is concerned uh, all the artistic products that I'm analyzing are the production of um, immigrants that are yeah, both internal immigrants and international immigrants. So they are actually born by a collaboration between different kinds of, of immigrants, both internal and external. And there's actually a lot of attention focused also on what you were mentioning. So the citizenship and the documentation and so projects that are helping uh, to, to underline social problems such as the, uh, the citizenship. And I'm thinking about this is not Argentina, but there is an example in Spain of projects based on artistic products created by immigrants. And the, the, the goal is to focus the international attention on their, their fights uh, to get citizenship and, and documentation. So I would say it's collaboration of both. Okay, so James and Olivia. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, I uh, just on Pete's question about rubbish and garbage. Um, I mean, I think Robert Stam is a good example. The Brazilian, you know, he writes a lot about Brazil and the kind of politics of garbage and how recycling is sort of uh, uh, um, a loaded act, I suppose, in an aesthetic sense, when you're talking about groups of people who otherwise are regarded as the kind of refuse of society and things like that. So it's quite a lot, you know, I think, I think you could explore the politics of that through that particular angle. I mean, my comment was more of a sort of a footnote really to your, your presentation. Um, you talked about how the edge of, of um, has different meanings and you can understand the edge in different ways in, in urban context, or I suppose any context. But um, I also sort of wanted to suggest that also you have to think about where the edge is. Um, uh, because it, the edge is different for different people, right? What, what's the frontier? What's the boundary? Where does it lie? Um, and, in, and in part, because I was, you, you, you labeled Juan Diego and Cardona's work on Villa Selina, his novels on Villa Selina, as being cultura villera. And I really don't see that because 
they're not set in shanty towns. Actually, those novels are set in Villa Celina, which is a really kind of perilous working class neighborhood that I, I think would be quite surprised to be described as a kind of a slum neighborhood. And that's really important because um, you know, you've got different gradations of edgeness, if you like, or frontierness um, that really have to be factored in because otherwise you end up with a very kind of dichotomous understanding of the city. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. It's, it's very important to, to define where the, the limits is in terms of not only like a physical border, but also metaphorical border and how people identify themselves on one side of the border to to the other. Yeah, I agree with you. Could I just add a, a footnote onto that? I mean, one of the aspects of looking at things from an ecological point of view is to take the long term perspective and to look at changes over time. Mm -hmm. And of course, we know from long experience that neighborhoods that start out as being extremely precarious over a period of you know, 20, 30, 40 years become highly consolidated. So that there's a the boundary that you're talking about is a movable one historically as well. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, an example would be the conventitios in, in Argentina who started as huge mansions for wealthy people. And then this population had to evacuate these areas due to uh, healthy problems. And then they became what are now conventitios. So absolutely, you can, you can totally mention that. Mm -hmm. Olivia, you, you have a question, right? Yes, yes, thanks. Uh, thank you, it was really interesting. Um, I think it builds in part on what have already been said, but uh, I was wondering uh, about the temporal depth of the kind of uh, hybridian mixtures you are talking about, because mm -hmm. of course, it, you are looking to in, into the, the process of, of migration and diasporic uh, formations into cities. So it's, it's, it's a kind of specific uh, um, topic and temporal um, segment uh, in time. But uh, this kind of hybridity also happens in, 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 in a context that have been characterized by different layers of mixtures over time. And I mean, going back to colonial uh, time and period. So I was wondering how you relate with this, how you see this kind of layers that, uh, well, that build a different kind of uh, maybe pictures in terms of uh, this hybridity and how this is, is uh, related to what is uh, happening in, that you're observing in, in your project. And I was also wondering um, if you use or analyze the, the concept of baroquism in your work. Um, okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, so no, I'm not, I have not considered the, the baroquism. Um, yeah, what, what do you, how, how do you study that? I mean, I was I, I was just uh, because related to this um, yes longer uh, time frame and and perspective, yeah. uh, I was thinking of uh, Tveria work, the one that has been recently published about uh, uh, modernity and and whiteness. Do you think it's quite interesting in terms of how how mixture mixture can be looked at in in the long term. Okay, I can see that. Yeah, like as we were saying, definitely we're talking about processes that started a long time ago and processes that are dynamics. And so they are in constant evolution and that they will evolve in the future. But I think that at the same time, while we are evolving in one direction, there are also circular movements. So there that we can we can see like phenomena that are coming back and they, they repeat themselves and the, so they, they keep being the same. And I think that, uh, I think I agree with you with the idea of, of seeing hybridity as, as layers of modifications and, and changes. And I do study that uh, from a, a long perspective. That's why I started with the 19th century and I think that that's very helpful to understand contemporary life because as I said 
you can definitely see a repetition of, of elements connected to, um, to hybridity. And that can help you investigate also contemporary phenomena and probably also anticipate uh, the, the dynamics that will, that will happen in, in the future. But I will definitely take a look at this um, concept of baroquismo and, and see uh, what kind of connections I can, I can draw from there. Thank you for the idea. Okay, well, um, there is an interesting resource that Peter Browning put on the on the chat, Nicola. I don't know if you you can see it. Yeah, yeah, uh, I'm looking at it now. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, uh, thank you very much, Nicole. Thank you everybody for uh, coming. I uh, hope to see you in a, in a, in a fortnight for our next talk, which will be by Patricio Simonetto, who is a visiting fellow at UCL, who will be talking about. Global, the global making of travesties, uh, popular culture and daily life technologies. And once again, many thanks Nicole for, for a very interesting talk. And uh, yeah, and see you, you all of you very soon. Thank you all for all the comments and the, the ideas. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>